Hi guys. Um, so just going through self-inflicted wound, S-I-W. Hopefully you've all worked out that's military abbreviation for self-inflicted wound, which was very common in the First World War. Just stolen this straight from Crossref. Um, according to that, the poem is that account of an ordinary young boy soldier. Um, and he's joining up even though his family have different views of the war so his dad thinks it's great and thinks that his son's going to be noble if he dies at war but he'd rather him be dead than a coward his mum's scared hopes he'll get a a wound that'll send him home his sisters wish they were able to fight and his brothers send him cigarettes so there's a real weird mix of reactions to that um and he ultimately lies to them and says he's really safe when he's not and that leads to his kind of depression and ultimately his self-inflicted wound Reminder that a blighty one is a war wound of sufficient severity to ensure the injured would return home. And this is what caused this idea of a self-inflicted wound. Lots of men saw people going home, being treated in nice hospitals, seeing their family and their loved ones and thought, oh, I want a bit of that. And would then shoot themselves in the foot or the hand so they could get sent home. It became quite a common thing. Owen's thought to have made this poem initially when he's at Craig Lockhart one of those hospitals I was talking about um and he might have seen people who had those self-inflicted wounds when he was at his casualty clearing station or when he was at the hospital um itself so it begins with this epigraph from a play it's by W.B. Yeats The King's Threshold I haven't read the play actually I did look for it I have a read of it couldn't really find copies of it online to have a read Um, But again, Crossref, it tells us that the play is a story of a poet who's thrown out of the king's court. I think it's an Irish court. And the poet is determined to make the king love poetry. So he goes on hunger strike to do that and decides he set his teeth to die, which is what the young soldier in SIW has done. So if you have a look at this a little bit closer, set his teeth means determination. Like You grit your teeth because you're going to do something. Um, In this case, he sets his teeth to die. And the person speaking assumes then that poets are disobedient and disciplined and disorderly and wants him to die and says, I cannot mourn him. He doesn't deserve my grief because it was his choice. And there's no acknowledgement of what pushed him to choose. Like if the king had accepted poetry, he wouldn't have had to have gone on hunger strike. He wouldn't have had to have died. But it's not the king's fault. It's his fault because he chose that death. So that's going to be really important later. This idea of a king also could be parallel to the King of England and the government who did not mourn or celebrate soldiers who killed themselves and thought they were cowards because they chose to die. Okay? Then we go into the prologue. This is the longest section. I'm sorry for all the arrows. I realise it will be a little bit confusing, but it starts with this idea of patting goodbye. Patting to me seems a bit patronising. Treating him like a child or a puppy, they pat him goodbye doubtless they told the lad again a bit patronizing it makes him sound young um it does suggest familiarity like they're fond of him but it doesn't necessarily sound like the loving son father mother brother sister relationship that he'd be looking for that colloquialism is quite common at the time though to refer to soldiers he'd always show the hun a brave man's face father would sooner him dead than in disgrace this suggests this pressure the home front pressure of what makes someone a man uh, a brave man shows the hun a brave face and doesn't show fear so it shows that influence of propaganda and it's quite an unrealistic view of the enemy calling it the hun and saying that you know as long as you show your brave face you'll be fine is quite naive of the family i think and the dad particularly seems quite unloving the pressure from him could suggest a lack of affection and therefore the son's trying to prove himself to his dad but the the dash there the separation between the disgrace and then the suggestion that the dad was proud to see him going yes and glad glad to see your son going to war doesn't necessarily seem a common reaction so i think that this dad is quite an interesting character within the poem and could reflect that older generation's view that it's honorable to die for your country reflecting back to those other poems that wilfred owen wrote about the same subject think about dolce et decorum est Um, The mum's a bit different. She does whimper, the onomatopoeia, raw emotion, fear. She does actually want to protect her son. She doesn't want him to get hurt. 
she wants him to come home so she can nurse him. But again, it's a naive view and it's quite oxymoronic because a safe wound, a nice safe wound to nurse is an unrealistic expectation. She just wants him to get a little scratch so he can come home and then seem brave. She doesn't really seem to understand what's going on. And that could again reflect Owen's frustrations about people and their view of war. The sisters would wish girls too could shoot, charge, curse. Brothers would send his favourite cigarette. There's a lack of pronoun there. It's not his sisters or his brothers. It just seems really general. So it could be applicable to all men and all women at home. As if they all want to have their own slice of the war. And again, don't necessarily understand it. This idea of the shooting, charging and cursing from the girls... They want to prove themselves, they don't understand. Um, so that listing is that unrealistic expectation. Makes it sound exciting. Whereas the boys send commodities like cigarettes. Um, and they don't send anything else. So there's like a lack of empathy for me. No real relationship there. Just here, have some cigarettes that'll keep you going. There is an implication they talk regularly. Each week, month after month, they wrote the same. Um, again, that repetition shows that time is dragging. And they are being good, they are staying in contact, but the war is not ending, he is not coming home. And he's lying to them, thinking him sheltered in some YM hut. If you look at YM, it's the YMCA, the um, Christian Association, the Young Men's Christian Association, where he is presumably safe. It's used to protect his family. He thinks that if he tells them this, they won't worry about him. But that makes him sound unheroic at the same time. If they think he's sheltered from the war, they're not going to be impressed by him. Because he said so, writing on his butt doesn't make him um, sound very brave either. Where once an hour a bullet missed its aim and misses teased the hunger of his brain, that that does reveal the reality. So we get this idea that there is a very real danger and that every hour it misses him. But it almost seems like he wants the wound. And the idea of it teasing him, personifying the bullets as they tease past him, shows that he's kind of hungry for some change even if that change comes in the form of death or injury so again quite interesting use of personification imagery there his eyes grow old with wincing his hand reckless with a courage leaked as sand from the best sandbags after years of rain we get this real idea from the metaphors there and the simile that there's a huge mental impact of these experiences he seems to be physically aging um, becoming clumsy and reckless and leaking like a sandbag after years it doesn't have that same ring of youth that he had at the beginning like he's been worn down and he's broken but they never leave a wound fever trench foot shock or untrap the wretch which again with that listing they never give him any physical damage which should be disappoint not disappointing it should be good but he seems disappointed because if he got one of those wounds, they would untrap him from war. And he's not untrapped. He's stuck there. So that's why Owen calls him a wretch. You see that real pity there. And death seemed still withheld for torture of lying machinally shelled. Machinally? Interesting word. At the pleasure of this world's powers who run amok. The idea that his death is withheld, again, should be a positive thing. But personification of death here, withholding itself from him suggests that he's being tortured constantly and that death, the ultimate promise, is not coming for him. And it all is for pleasure. It's the pleasure of the world's powers. The world's powers in this case are government leaders, kings, people who are in charge, who are taking pleasure, in Owen's mind, in running this war. And he's suggesting that their powers are running amok, they're running wild, uncontrolled. He'd seen men shoot their hands... He's had that inspiration, he's seen that happen, he's seen other men break, and he's outlasted them. But it means he's now got this idea, and potentially he's going to run with it, foreshadowing what he's going to do later. The people never knew, yet they were vile. Death sooner than dishonour, that's the style, so father said. This idea of it being vile um, has this indirect discourse, like it sounds like his dad's words, yet they were vile. And then you've got the direct discourse from his father quoting him and the tone seems quite unconvinced I think so father said like the son's now starting to question his dad and make his own decisions that brings us into the action one dawn is quite interesting as a method of starting this because dawn is supposed to promise new life isn't it hope sun rises darkness ends but in this morning our wire patrol carried him so he's dead 
the barbed wire patrol they go around and they they find him draped on the barbed wire and they carry him away this time death had not missed again personifying death but this time it has found the boy this short sentence adds that kind of finality to his life it had not missed it's over we could do nothing but wipe his bleeding cough the we there that collective pronoun includes the reader and all the soldiers no one could do anything for him at this point um the bleeding cough is quite a graphic description of his dying and then we go into the kind of interrogation of it could it be accident rifles go off not sniped no those repeated questions and the indirect speech from the soldiers reflect the men who found him in their investigations into this the death of their friend i suppose rifles do go off suggests that they're trying to give him the benefit of the doubt and the ellipsis suggests maybe they don't believe it was an accident that's confirmed with the no that one word sentence it confirms their doubts it's dramatic it's final and that is then elaborated even more in that parentheses which reveals the bullet that shot him was english it was his own finally the title here seems quite ironic the action but it happens after the action's already passed and is over he's already dead there is no action in this stanza so that is quite an interesting choice of title and that might be worth commenting on in terms of structure the poem is another interesting one. This is much more of Owen's style. It was the reasoned crisis of his soul. This is quite oxymoronic as well. Reason suggests logic, um, and crisis of soul suggests no logic. Um, but he's reasoned with himself to do that unreasonable. He's pitted his logic against the chaos of war, and he's come up with death. So that's quite a powerful image as well. Against more days of inescapable thrall, against infrangibly wired and blind trench wall he's decided to escape and there's this idea of trapment entrapment he's trapped inescapable means he can't get out thrall is to be under someone else's power like a slave infrangibly wired is unbreakably wired like the barbed wire cannot be broken he cannot get out and the blind trench wall sounds quite claustrophobic and it, it again uses personification the wall is blinding him, or maybe it's blind to his suffering, but either way, it's surrounding him and he can't leave. It's also curtained with fire, roofed in with creeping fire, slow grazing fire that would not burn him whole. So you've got loads of repetition of fire here, three times, in fact. Curtain suggests it's decorative, almost, um, and separating him from the light. Roofed suggests it's all-encompassing, it's on top of him slowly pushing him down further, creeping closer. And slow grazing makes the fire sound like it's enjoying itself, it's eating slowly, eating the men for pleasure like cattle would. But it still went by on him whole, um, so he can't die. And this takes us into the final two lines. It kept him for death's promises and scoff. Death promises him he will die eventually but the fire just choosing not to burn him whole it's, it's doing it really slowly and mocking him scoff is to mock so death is mocking him by not killing him straight away but also life is half promising which is even more painful because he's got some hope but that almost makes the promise of death much worse and then both life and death seem to be riling they're irritating they're irritating to him or to each other like life and death are at war and we have to decide, is it annoying to the men or is it annoying to life and death themselves? Is it annoying to the boy? That's a little bit unclear, but you get this kind of idea that life and death are battling for him and that death eventually will win and has. Again, the title's interesting. This is the poetic version of the same events. So it's more in line with Owen's usual style with lots of figurative language and powerful imagery. And it kind of glamorizes, I suppose, what he's done to justify the actions that he's taken. The epilogue, the aftermath, um, is them burying him. And it talks about how they buried the muzzle. The muzzle is the end of an animal's face, its snout, its nose, it could be a human face as well. And also the open end of a gun. So it makes the gun sound like it's alive, also, like an animal or a person. And that his teeth had kissed it is quite a romantic and yet equally horrific image that his teeth kissed the gun as it shot him not nice as you can imagine what that would do to have shot yourself at that closer range and truthfully wrote the mother tim died smiling now this could be they 
they truthfully wrote to the mother or it could be the mother's truthfully writing either way it's important and the adverb truthfully it's usually a white lie that you might be told to make a death seem more palatable easier to cope with but in this case it actually probably was true he probably was smiling because it was a relief but he's not smiling for the reasons his family would expect so in a way it's still a lie that they've told her tim died smiling Tim's named, which is actually really unusual. Owen I mean, doesn't often name his personas. It makes the story more emotionally powerful, I think, um, because it makes it sound real. It could also be quite graphic. Again, in terms of the gun in the mouth, him dying smiling could be referring to the shape of his mouth with the gun inside it. So not a nice note to finish on necessarily, but you get the emotional significance of that few notes on tone um i'm just going to borrow these from where you've already read it probably on cross ref but the tone's quite interesting in this one and i think i would agree that owen's tone is quite vague so we have to ask ourselves the question does he agree with tim's father because there are times where he makes the the actions sound pitiable in a negative way but also does he sympathize because we do see the justification of it we see the torture the hell on earth it's quite unclear, it's quite open to interpretation. I think you could interpret that either way um, and argue both sides, depending what your view is, or you could argue both and come to the conclusion that it is unclear, and that's okay as well. In terms of structure, we know it's in four parts, prologue, action, poem, epilogue, and they've got that epigraph at the beginning, so it's worth mentioning that if you are going to talk about this poem. And then rhyme and rhythm. In terms of rhyme, there is that straightforward pattern of rhymes. Um, it's in the prologue, the ABBA pattern, it's regular, it's predictable, suggests that the regular predictable behaviour of those at home is obvious, you know, that everyone who's been influenced by that propaganda is predictable, stable. There's no fighting away from it. It only breaks down at the point where he takes his own life and that could suggest that that action is inevitable, unavoidable, but it breaks with the normality of home life and it breaks with what propaganda tells us about the war. In terms of rhythm, there is regular iambic pentameter for most of it, in the prologue especially, um, but that last line, so far the said, is brief. It doesn't use iambic pentameter and it makes up for the iambic hexameter. Hex meaning six, is that right? think so um hexagon guys you're better at math than me you know you are um and where his dad's got too much to say both lines are in part reason uh, responsible for what happens next so that breaking of the pentameter is kind of caused by the dad we could argue then it's quite disjointed quite broken there's lots of caesura lots of line breaks with um, punctuation used to cut the dialogue and the action into different parts and then in the poem, it goes back into iambic pentameter. Um, but he does break it where he wants to draw attention to certain places. 